This is the age of planetary exploration, when our ships have begun to sail the heavens. In those heavens, there are some worlds much like hell. Our planet is, in comparison, much like a heaven. But the gates of heaven and hell are adjacent and unmarked. We've evolved on the planet Earth, and so we find it a congenial place. But just next door is Venus, until recently enveloped in mystery. It has almost the same size and mass as the Earth. Might our sister world be a balmy summer planet, a little warmer than the Earth because it's a little closer to the sun? Are there craters, volcanoes, mountains, oceans, life? From a distance, our sister planet seems serene and peaceful, its clouds motionless. These clouds are near the top of a great ocean of air, about a hundred kilometers thick, composed mainly of carbon dioxide. There's some nitrogen, a little water vapor and other gases, but only the merest trace of hydrocarbons. And the clouds turn out to be not water, but a concentrated solution of sulfuric acid. Even in the high clouds, Venus is a thoroughly nasty place. The clouds are stained yellow by sulfur. There are great lightning storms. As we descend, there are increasing amounts of the noxious gas sulfur dioxide. The pressures become so high that early Venera spacecraft were crushed like old tin cans by the weight of the surrounding atmosphere. Beneath the clouds, in the dense clear air, it's about as bright as on an overcast day on Earth, but the atmosphere is so thick that the ground seems to ripple and distort. The atmospheric pressure down here is 90 times that on Earth. The temperature is 380 degrees centigrade, 900 Fahrenheit, hotter than the hottest household oven. This is a world marked by searing heat, crushing pressures, sulfurous gases, and a desolate reddish landscape far from the balmy paradise imagined by some early scientists. Venus is the one place in the solar system most like hell. But today, as in ancient tradition, there are travelers who will dare a visit to the underworld. Venera 9 was the first spacecraft in human history to return a photograph from the surface of Venus. It found the rocks curiously eroded, perhaps by the corrosive gases, Perhaps because the temperature is so high that the rocks are partly molten and sluggishly flow. The Soviet Venera spacecraft, their electronics long ago fried, are slowly corroding on the surface of Venus. They are the first spaceships from Earth ever to land on another planet. The reason Venus is like hell seems to be what's called the greenhouse effect. Ordinary visible sunlight penetrates the clouds and heats the surface, but the dense atmosphere blankets the surface and prevents it from cooling off to space. An atmosphere 90 times as dense as ours, made of carbon dioxide, water vapor and other gases, lets in visible light from the sun, but will not let out the infrared light radiated by the surface. So the temperature rises until the infrared radiation trickling out to space just balances the sunlight reaching the surface. The greenhouse effect can make an Earth-like world into a planetary inferno. In this cauldron, there is not likely to be anything alive, even creatures very different from us. Organic and other conceivable biological molecules would simply fall to pieces. The hell of Venus is in stark contrast with the comparative heaven of its neighboring world, our little planetary home, the Earth. Here, the atmosphere is 90 times thinner. Here, the carbon dioxide and water vapor make a modest greenhouse effect, which heats the ground above the freezing point of water. Without it, our oceans would be frozen solid. A little greenhouse effect is a good thing. But Venus is an ominous reminder that on a world rather like the Earth, things can go wrong. There is no guarantee that our planet will always be so hospitable. To maintain this clement world, we must understand it and appreciate it. The Earth 
is a place to our eyes more beautiful than any other that we know. The destruction of trees and grasslands makes the surface of the earth brighter. It reflects more sunlight back to space and cools our planet. After we discovered fire, we began to incinerate forests intentionally to clear the land by a process called slash and burn agriculture. And today, forests and grasslands are being destroyed frivolously, carelessly, by humans who are heedless of the beauty of our cousins, the trees, and ignorant of the possible climatic catastrophes which large-scale burning of forests may bring. The indiscriminate destruction of vegetation may alter the global climate in ways that no scientist can yet predict. It has already deadened large patches of the Earth's life-supporting skin. And yet we ravage the Earth at an accelerated pace, as if it belonged to this one generation, as if it were ours to do with as we please. The Earth has mechanisms to cleanse itself, to neutralize the toxic substances in its system. But these mechanisms work only up to a point. Beyond some critical threshold, they break down. The damage becomes irreversible. Our generation must choose. Which do we value more, short-term profits or the long-term habitability of our planetary home? The world is divided politically, but ecologically it is tightly interwoven. There are no useless threads in the fabric of the ecosystem. If you cut any one of them, you will unravel many others. We have uncovered other worlds with choking atmospheres and deadly surfaces. Shall we then recreate these hells on Earth? We have encountered desolate moons and barren asteroids. Shall we then scar and crater this blue-green world in their likeness? Natural catastrophes are rare, but they come often enough. We need not force the hand of nature. If we ruin the Earth, there is no place else to go. This is not a disposable world, and we are not yet able to re-engineer the planets. The cruelest desert on Earth is far more hospitable than any place on Mars. The bright sandy surface and dusty atmosphere of Mars reflect enough sunlight back to space to cool the planet, freezing out all its water, locking it in a perpetual ice age. Human activities brighten our landscape and our atmosphere. Might this ultimately make an ice age here? At the same time, we are releasing vast quantities of carbon dioxide, increasing the greenhouse effect. The Earth need not resemble Venus very closely for it to become barren and lifeless. It may not take much to destabilize the Earth's climate, to convert this heaven, our only home in the cosmos, into a kind of hell. The study of the global climate the sun's influence, the comparison of the Earth with other worlds. These are subjects in their earliest stages of development. They are funded poorly and grudgingly. And meanwhile, we continue to load the Earth's atmosphere with materials about whose long-term influence we are almost entirely ignorant. There are worlds that began with as much apparent promise as Earth, but something went wrong. Knowing that worlds can die alerts us to our danger. If a visitor arrived from another world, what account would we give of our stewardship of the planet Earth?